Hello, my name is Janne Kauhanen, and I'm the host and sauna mayor of Cybersecurity Sauna. Today's special episode was recorded on site at the With Secure Sphere 23 Cybersecurity Unconference in Helsinki, where we had an opportunity to talk to some of the guest speakers. I've just been joined by security foreign policy anal- analyst Jessica Berlin and uh, threat intelligence analyst Stephen Robinson to discuss where cyber attacks fit in today's geopolitical landscape. Now, Jessica, can you tell our listeners a little bit about sort of how your work, like the Ukraine invasion by Russia in, in February uh, 22 changed a lot of things for a lot of people, but I, I'm guessing you especially. How did your work change? Changed completely. Yeah. I basically threw my old work out the window. Um, it didn't start that way. Um, in January, I uh, I was getting pretty nervous and frustrated looking at the response from the German government in particular to to Russia's buildup on on the border. And I reached out to the Ukrainian uh, community in Berlin where I live and just basically offered to help, you know, as a German with some political and political communications experience, you know, how can I help you guys get your message out more? And that's how it started. But then when the full-scale invasion came, then it was just all chaos. And uh, I was helping with all manner of things, uh, you know, trying to help get people evacuated, uh, and dealing with embassies, uh, aid deliveries. And um, over the subsequent weeks, as it became clear that the German government was not going to step up uh, and not uh, deliver heavy weapons uh, and dragging their feet, I basically said, well, I'm an independent consultant. I have the freedom and flexibility to determine my workload. So I um, I finished my outstanding deliverables from my normal work. Um, and by April then, um, and since April of last year, I've been supporting the Ukrainian war effort full time. Okay. So in Finland, we're very interested in everything Russia is doing because they're right over there across the border. So their relationship with the whole global community has changed dramatically since the invasion started. Have you seen a shift in sort of their cyber operations? Yeah, absolutely. So Russia really folded in the, the new cyber and they brought a lot more of their criminal organizations into the fold. There was always that tacit acknowledgement that as long as you're targeting people outside of Russia, as a criminal, you know, you can do whatever you want. And that's, I think, always been made official now. I said, you know, if you're hacking in support of the war effort, then that's fine by the Russian government. And it's also caused, you know, the, uh, the explosion of pretty much the leading ransomware group because they came out, Conti, and said, we support the Russian government. And then, <laughs> then they were taken apart from the inside by just, you know, they, they were torn apart. And it was almost like a comedy sketch in that they stepped forward and said that. And then the other leading groups went, um, we're apolitical. And, and they're, they're still going. But that's... You know, that collapse and the dissemination and the, you know, the people that we can track moving around and the collapse of the ceasefire of we don't target Russian or Russian speaking, you know, uh, people, organizations, that's completely gone. And that kind of Commonwealth of Independent States, the former Soviet republics, it just almost became kind of a, a free for all or at least a, you know, a, a further part of that war front. And there's been a lot of theoretical cyber warfare you know, uh, 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 work that people have done, but we're kind of seeing it now. What has always been the, you know, well, it's, it's obviously Russia, but it's not Russia. Now it definitely is, and they are completely aligned with their their government goals. So it's in, it's re, it's 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 interesting to see from outside of the firing line, at least. Does that match what you you've been seeing, Jessica? Does it sound familiar? Yeah, you know, I wouldn't speak to the the technical side of it. You know, I'm not a cybersecurity sure. specialist, but what what we do see at the sort of political geopolitical level is an increase in attacks, um, more brazen. We also know the volume is increasing, um, and from the Ukrainian side, you know, it's just exploded. So mm-hmm. from shall we say informal conversations and contacts with Ukrainian security officials and as well as um, civil society and techies, basically from the civilian side in Ukraine, who are, of course, supporting the Ukrainian war effort, um, say it's, you know, it's around the qual- cyber warfare. Mm, yeah. And I think the important thing to note here is that this is not new. Mm. You know, our systems, you know, whether whether it's private companies or public sector infrastructure and systems, 
not to mention our elections, Russia and China in particular have been attacking uh, and finding vulnerabilities in these systems for years. Absolutely. So that's it's both good and bad news. I mean, the bad news is, yes, it's getting more and getting worse. But the good news is it's it's now getting more recognized. And so with this recognition, this increased visibility that uh, the full-scale invasion have given to what Russia and indeed China are about, mm. uh, that's given us an urgency at the political level and in public awareness, public opinion, that hopefully can leverage states to invest more in our cyber defense because the information war is half the war. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it feels like that information war is really happening in places that governments haven't wanted to regulate before. People go, oh, it's social media, it's, it's self-regulating, it's whatever. And actually, when you're talking about the place that people get their information, it needs to be trusted and trustworthy. And Russia, as we said, have been practicing this for so long. And you know, a number of years ago, they were you know, doing disinformation campaigns, obviously, I'm pretty sure that they they tested out some of their cyber attacks on the Ukrainian energy networks you know, before before this all began. So the geopolitical ripple effect of this invasion has been far and wide, but how have other countries other than Russia and Ukraine sort of received it? Countries or even organizations like were we prepared for this? No, no, no. We're still not. Yeah, uh, we, we're we're still in the phase of. Uh, looking at the house on fire and going, oh dear, does anyone have a bucket? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it has, it's been interesting as, uh, as Russia have targeted people who've come out in support of Ukraine. So there's been targeting of European countries when they make statements or shipments or whatever else, um, specific MPs or MEPs based on the direction that they voted. One interesting thing that happened that I don't think anyone really expected was about a week before the invasion, I think I, said, I might be wrong on the dates, obviously, but China, the Chinese actors launched hacking campaigns against Russian military near the border and the EU because they obviously went, oh, crap, we need to know what's going on. And so they, you know, someone reached for a lever and that lever was cyber. And so it's not just necessarily, you know, Russia and Ukraine, it's people engaged in the war. It's people who want to know about the war as well. Okay. What about the, um, you know, we're talking about Russian threat actors, but what about the threat actors in other countries? Have they sort of changed their operations in response to what's been happening? Well, often kind of current current topics are are used for uh, for phishing emails and so on, for targeting, for, for um, water hole, watering holes. And if you think about the people who are interested in the Russia-Ukraine war, then those are also people who are likely to be targeted, yeah. journalists, uh, politicians, all of this. So, so that's led to a kind of shifting in that kind of window dressing. I think there's also a lot more that's happened around the kind of dissemination of, of, of tools as well. Like I said about you know, that group collapsed and their tooling suddenly spread everywhere. And that has had an effect in that we've had this blurring as people have started to just use you know, it's like a gun falling into the hands of a toddler kind of thing, and someone can suddenly go off with it. One of the, I know, one of the funniest things, funny might be the wrong word, but it's uh, the whole anonymous Sudan, mm. which I don't know if you heard of that one, Jessica. It's, it's basically, they call themselves anonymous Sudan, as in they're an anonymous, you know, section from Sudan. Just happens to use, you know, the same telegram channel that a Russian uh, disinformation group used to use and are based in Russia, and uh, their description is written in Cyrillic. That's adorable. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, maybe even adorable. To, to, to quote uh, a Ukrainian soldier who gave this interview last year sometime, it's lucky for us they're so stupid. <laughs> yes. Okay. Unfortunately, all that stupid is backed up with quite a lot of money mm. and a lot of resource, so they are able to spray and pray. Yes. Yeah. And and this is the inverse of what we have. You know, we uh, we collectively, as the uh, the democratic uh, industrialized world, mm. we have also a lot of resources and talent, yeah. but we don't have the will to use it. We don't have the long term strategy to deploy it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, from the private sector side, where most of the, the resource and talent and understanding of the problem are, well, first and foremost, you're reacting to what your shareholders and your boards of directors are saying. And you're planning things on a quarterly and annual basis. Mm -hmm. And 
international security is not your responsibility. Whereas on the other hand, we have public sector whose job it would be to defend against these threats and solve these problems, but they don't have the knowledge. They don't know what is the shape of the problem and what a solution should look like. So this is where we need to, we need to invent new rules mm. and new plays to win this game. You know, because right now we're, we're just, we're watching the fire burn and say, oh goodness, it's, it's getting hot in here, isn't it? I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that, that people are starting to get it. Uh, and as, as I just said in the talk, I really think there's an opportunity right now for private sector cybersecurity companies to wag the dog of the state by getting started. Do what you do best. Start prototyping. Start putting stuff out there. Uh, work together, you know, spread, spread the work and load and, and the, the resource and, and the risk. Um, but consider it an investment in your long-term business development and your immediate term, uh, risk, political risk. And it is, it is a stated goal of Wistica, which is one of the things I like about Wistica. Why, why I joined really is that they want to, you know, make the internet better and more secure because it is a, it is easy to be short sighted about the internet and go, well, you know, my computer is fine, but if you're constantly streaming in the sewage of open internet, there's not being, you know, defended and you've got issues. But decisions are made in response to information. And, and with these operations ongoing, there's, uh, there's concerns about disinformation uh, that are only getting worse. So what kind of tactics are we seeing in disinformation space? And what, what kind of a role do these campaigns play in foreign policy, for example? It's extremely dangerous. Disinformation has taken on a life of its own. At this point, it's hard to even track certain conspiracy theories uh, and falsifications to their root. And that's just an indicator of how successful these campaigns have been. It's become standard operating procedure. As Stephen mentioned earlier, you know, in the social media space, we left the door wide open. Uh, there was no attempt to, to regulate content to stop malign actors from putting out disinformation. It's not illegal. Mm. Freedom of speech, at so many levels, authoritarian regimes are using our freedoms against us as weapons. It's very clever, really, when you, when you think about it. If we're allowed to say whatever the hell we want and spread it to millions, well, in the global uh, world and uh, certainly the global communication space that is social media, th what they've done is not illegal. Right. The price of me being able to say whatever I want is that everybody else gets to as well. Yeah. And so then being able to create automized uh, bot accounts mm. that repeat and amplify uh, disinformation uh, that know exactly how the algorithms work mm. to amplify and, and spread these things, um, to show that there's a consensus and support for a certain narrative right. that doesn't even exist, yeah. but giving the impression of, of support and, and public opinion. So the good news is now we know that these things are happening. The bad news is we still have no real way of regulating it. It's still uh, technically not illegal. And, you know, Twitter is, has become a complete yeah. disaster site. Facebook is a mess, you know. They, they say that they're that they're on it, but let's be honest, you know, we're all in those spaces every day. Mm -hmm. It is a mess. So is regulation the key? What do you want to see happen in this space? First and foremost, regulation, but that's not going to, it's not going to be enough at this point. Mm -hmm. The cat's already out of the bag. Right. Good luck catching it and stuffing it back in. Yeah. I'd actually be interested to hear from a technical side what's even possible because, you know, that's where, you know, I'm, I'm a political scientist. I don't know how in a system like that you can go after uh, the the bot generators. How do you how do you detect it? How do you how do you stealth them down? It's a huge issue that you know content moderation is. It's something. The reason these social networks aren't doing it is obviously that part of it is the kind of legal thing of once they step in and make a decision, they are then responsible for the content they have. But from a technical viewpoint, it's becoming harder and harder. And chatting to Andy Patel about his chat GPT research. It's so on trend to this, you know, it, it's almost a terrible time for it to appear, really. Oh, I don't know that there'd be a good time, but the ability to generate large volumes of legitimate looking, not simply content, but discourse online, you know, for an AI playing multiple roles to have a conversation that seems legitimate and to, and to then amplify that through bots. And so to try 
it is that issue that to try and technically identify and take these things down or diffuse them, it's going to almost require an application of the same technology because you can't hire enough people to, you know, to monitor all of these situations, but you can hire AI to it, hopefully. Yeah. I think one thing that is crucially important and that Finland has been an excellent example of is if you can't attack them and take them down on a technical level, what you can do is increase user awareness and understanding of how to recognize false content and, and, and fake accounts. This, I think, is uh, from a political education uh, perspective, really important. Just making people aware, uh, little tutorials. Also, what what the social media platforms themselves could do is is put warnings on accounts that look suspicious. Yes. Um, so that any any post coming from them, even if it hasn't been able for whatever technical or legal reason, it hasn't been closed yet. Mm. This looks like it might be a bot account. This yeah. this account was just created last week, and yeah. it, so just putting little warnings to help make people more aware yeah. uh, would be also a strong starting point. Yeah, and that and that user education is really important from the more narrow kind of cybersecurity thing because the methods being used, this is where Russia has has had this kind of leg up really, is that the methods being used for political disinformation and, you know, uh, fake engagement online are used for phishing, for cyber attacks more widely. So a well-educated user is one of the best defenses you can have. That makes sense to me. I want to thank you guys for for talking to us about this hairy, hairy topic today. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was the show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Please get in touch with us through Twitter with the hashtag CyberSauna with your feedback, comments and ideas. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe.